Thank you, Bertrand. The floor is yours. Okay, so we're going to speak about Embark, which is the end stage BCR, if I may say. Those these are my conflict of interest. I have a lot of conflict of interest with Embark, a lot of conflict of interest with enzalutamide. I've done most of my career on that drug, so but I'm going to try to give you my vision of it. Uh, Embark is one of the most discussed trial. I mean, and a trial I did a lot of enemy, especially amongst the radiation oncology community, because I think there was a big misunderstanding in the result of Embark. So we wrote several, uh, we wrote several editorial with Veran, with Gianluca Giannarini, and we had a lot of hate spreading on X for a while. I looked like Elon Musk. So many people ha hating me. I think the problem is that. There are two messages in Embark, which are totally different. It's how you do hormone therapy and when you do hormone therapy. The how you do hormone therapy is a fact. This is level one evidence. The second, when, it's just hypothesis generating, and I'm going to give you my view on this. The how is a fact. When a BCR patient needs systemic therapy. And that's the problem. Because in the last 20 years, we were never, never able to say he needs hormone therapy. But that's absolutely hypocritical. Because everybody here in the room, at some point in time, know that patient, I'm going to give him hormone therapy. The game is done. Let's start him on ADT. What Embark is telling us is that when we believe a BCR patient needs systemic therapy, Adding enzalutamide on top of MDT significantly improve MFS and OS. And that is, that is a fact. These are high risk. They need hormonal treatment. And if you use a hormonal treatment, it must include enzalutamide, probably as a generic name for all other ARPI. It increases MFS. It will increase OS. It's a matter of months. The toxicity is absolutely predictable. It's the same good enzalutamide. I've been the referring physician for Astellas at EMA. It was always the same reporter. They would tell you that since Affirm, the toxicity of enzalutamide hasn't changed. It induced great events. What? Fatigue mostly. Uh, cognitive defect. Fall. So that's absolutely expected. But if you need hormone therapy, it should be minimum doublet. The second message is more disrupting. For, I mean, for me, it was not a surprise. It's been like my, my fight for the last 10 years. But we haven't realized probably yet that in the couple ADT to ARPI, don't be mistaken, the strong agent is the ARPI. It's not the ADT. And I understand it's disruptive. But after Embark, the question is no more which patient on ADT needs an ARPI, but what patient on ARPI needs ADT? We have reversed the question and show that actually it is better than ADT alone. We haven't found yet what patient should benefit from ADT, from enzalutamide monotherapy, but that's a fact. If you take MFS, which in that setting is a surrogate for OS, enzalutamide alone does better than luprolide alone. And this is the true probably for all the ARPI. We did a darlutamide monotherapy trial with EORTC. The result in terms of PSA control is stunning if you compare to ADT alone. No surprise either, it is not less toxic than ADT because enzalutamide has its own toxicity. But what you're going to do is you're going to switch the toxicity. You're going to get rid of toxicity induced by the hormones, such as hot flushes, sarcopenia, lipid changes, things you don't see in Embark yet, but that was seen in the phase two with it 10 years ago. And what you're going to gain is gynecomastia, nipple pain, breast tenderness. So basically, you're changing the toxicity profile, but don't say it's less toxic. Is it a group of patients that will benefit from uh, AR monotherapy? Clearly, the patients that are willing to preserve their sexual function. We had a lot of discussion uh, in the previous session about adding ADT does impede the sexual activity. In country like the UK or Belgium, we've been using b 150 a lot in these patients receiving radiotherapy. We know it preserves sexual function. So there will be, we, we will refine that. 
The second question embark race is a when question, and this one I understand it is more controversial, and this is hypothesis generating. And what I'm going to give you is not the truth, it's just my view on how embark is actually disrupting the management of high risk BCR. But before that, a preamble, a very important preamble. I spent my life doing randomized controlled trial with EORTC. There is always a misconception, and this is the difference between the inclusion criteria and the real characteristic of the patient in the trial. And in EMBARC, it's striking. EMBARC inclusion criteria were still quite early rise in PSA. It was patient with a PSA above one, and a PSA doubling time less than nine months. So it's already, I mean, quite, quite, quite high risk. But actually, when you look at the patient characteristics, it's, 70, it's close to 80 person with a PSA doubling time less than six months and an average PSA of 4.6. So this is not the patient uh, Professor Oskin was discussing a few minutes ago. What we are, are patients who have gone below that threshold. This would be a typical Embark patient. It's a patient who had a prostatectomy Gleason 8 for very, so very high risk patient. He had a rapid progression. At a PSA of 0.42, he refuses salvage radiation therapy, was left on his PSA, and then it's coming to you. He's got a PSA doubling time of 3.5 months. He's got and high risk, and you know the one who would tell me here in the room that he would not give ADT to that patient. I would have a hard time to believe that. So that's to me a typical Embark patient. So, but it's still a BCR. So if you look, if you look at the guidelines, what they told you, they told you, oh, you should do salvage radiation therapy. Do not wait for a PSA threshold before starting treatment. It means that technically speaking, that patient could as well receive uh, salvage radiation therapy. But we would all agree he's not going to respond. His PSA is way above 1.5, and he's got a lot of features that make him unlikely to respond to uh, salvage radiation therapy. So that old discussion about, wow, the Embark patient, Embark, it's a very wrong trial because 25 patients have not received salvage radiation therapy. Who would give salvage radiation therapy only to a patient like this? Would be surprised in the real life. So that patient is very unlikely to benefit from salvage treatment. What do the guidelines say? They say you should offer a PET PSMA. That I would agree. Everybody would agree on that. Let's do a PET PSMA. You know, in a patient like this, if you do a PET PSMA, he's going to get metastasis. Carolyn show you that. This patient is probably early metastatic. And that's what we did, and he's got a big metastasis in the scapula. So that patient is oligometastatic, and indeed, like Caroline says, that patient is an oriole patient or a stomp patient. So does it still make sense in that patient to apply salvage radiation therapy, uh, metastatic targeted therapy only in that patient with the idea of delaying hormone therapy in a patient like this? Not sure. Actually, keep in mind what Stomp and Orioles have shown, clearly I would say, although it's a limited number of patients, is that it actually delay the start of ADT. But this uh, update shows that it's never been proved to increase radiographic progression-free survival, CRPC and OS. And actually, the median delay of ADT is plus minus six months. So you're going to delay... If you believe in long-term depot, I don't know, Eligard, you're going to gain one shot of Eligard in a patient that's still going to live a long term. So I'm going to be very provocative, but I would say that at this point in time, there is no study showing that in very high risk like this, applying prostate bed radiotherapy at this point in time will delay MFS or OS versus observation. We know what we know is that adjuvant increase OS, at least in the U.S. trial, and that salvage is equivalent to adjuvant. Patients with high risk feature and those with distant lesion on PET PSMA, they don't do well with salvage RT. And they need ADT anyway. This was shown by Dr. Oskin. They need two years of ADT anyway. 
And MDT has been shown to delay ADT initiation, but not to increase MFS or OS. But why did we felt for all these years that it was acceptable? And to me, this is a very important point. Because at the same point, we had failed to show that ADT increased overall survival. We've never shown that starting hormone therapy in that patient will make it live longer. The only trial will give a glimpse of benefit was the TROC uh, trial, who show a small benefit in overall survival. But it's interesting, if you read the editorial by Duchenne himself, he says, probably doesn't, probably does not good enough to start hormone therapy in all these patients. But no, with Embark, it is different. With Embark, we show that enzalutamide increase overall survival. Over ADT, that probably does not increase overall survival. So you can treat as well ADT as a placebo, but enzalutamide, whether it's alone or on top of ADT, it's a different discussion, it do increase overall survival. So my question to you is, is it still acceptable in such a patient to use strategy that delay a drug that increase overall survival? Because the debate is totally different. So I would oppose as a new strategy that high-risk embark patient. I'm not speaking about the guy who is 82 years old, who had a radical five years ago, who has a PSA at 1.1 with a PSA doubling time of 10 months. No, I'm speaking about the patient who had a very aggressive disease, rapid PSA doubling time, Gleason 9, Gleason 10. I would say that the standard of care is no to start that patient on enzalutamide. And when we wrote that, we had a lot of backfire from the radiation oncology community, but say what about radiotherapy? My personal opinion is that it gives actually radiotherapy a much larger pawn to play. Because actually what it changed is that you're not gonna longer use radiotherapy and metastatic targeted therapy to delay the onset of uh, systemic treatment, but to build on its efficacy. Why? Because Embark is also admirable on the fact that it uses the standard of care in, in terms of systemic treatment, meaning it allows one cycle of intermittent androgen deprivation therapy, meaning after nine months of treatment, if your PSA reach 0.2, which is a vast majority of the patient, you would stop the treatment. And you look, how long would you stop the treatment? 20 months if you got the combination, 16.8 and 11.1, but it's not the same thing because one group is eugonadol, one group is 50% testosterone suppressed. And that gives us a new endpoint. That new endpoint is how could we extend the duration of the off interval by combining systemic treatment and bark light and either metastatic targeted therapy or even salvage radiation therapy if the patient has not received it yet. And actually, that's exactly the EXTEND trial, where they took patients with oligometastatic prostate cancer, less than five metastases, treated with hormone therapy, where randomized combined therapy and hormone therapy only, and what they show is in terms of progression-free survival, adding, adding do, doing it the other way around, adding the local treatment on top of the hormone therapy, increase the benefit of the hormone therapy. And similar to Embark, extend use an intermittent, in, uh, independent, um, intermittent androgen deprivation therapy setting and show that basically you also increase much more than your six months of delaying treatment the duration of eugonagol progression-free survival, meaning with a normal testosterone and hopefully a good quality of life. So in conclusion, I think that after Embark, in Embark patient, don't tell me that I say things differently, in Embark treatment, the standard of care now is enzalutamide. Whether you give it alone or together with ADT, it's a totally different discussion. It's gonna mature over time, don't worry. They're going to come with new data. They're going to be other trial, other drug. But at this, at this point in time, it's barely acceptable to say in a patient like the one we discussed, I'm going to discuss the, the delay the start on enzalutamide. 
And I think that it doesn't move away new imaging technology and stereotactic ablative strategy, but it offers a unique opportunity to increase efficacy and still decrease the exposure to the ARPI, which is a problem. Thank you very much for your attention.